Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, so, to, well, I'm gonna combine a couple laps here, okay? We're really just gonna go over all of the digestive tract. Uh, not in huge detail, mostly gonna be on the PowerPoint. Um, I brought this model uh, with me from the university, uh, but uh, when I opened up the cavity, I didn't have any of the organs in it. So I picked the one model that didn't have the organs. So I can't really go over that in detail with you and pull the actual organs out, which was uh, what my plan was. Um, nevertheless, we will have two PowerPoints that I'm going to go through today. And we're going to go into detail with some of the organs. I want you to start and stop it. I went through it pretty fast, um, but I'd really like you to take your time through it, pause it, rewind it, listen to some of the stuff, especially the areas that I say this is important. We will have an exam, this lab, uh, I believe last lab we didn't, okay? It was just the assignments, okay? Um, you have assignments as well for this lab. So make sure you have that lab assignment sheet open and uh, yeah, let's get right to it, okay? All right, so let's just go ahead and move on forward with the digest digestive system. Okay, so main functions of the digestive system, right? I mean, these are pretty self-explanatory. This is kind of common sense here, right? We take in food, break it down, break it into nutrient molecules. Um, those molecules then absorb into the bloodstream. This is where we get a lot of our uh, essential uh, amino acids and essential vitamins. Uh, basically, the difference between essential and non-essential is is just as it sounds. Essential is essential to our body, and our body does not readily make it on its own. Uh, non-essential means that our body can produce it on its own to some sort of facet, as long as it has the substrates available. Uh, and then lastly is a uh, rid body of any uh, indigestible remains, okay? Um, this section right here, or these main functions, this is directly correlated to your assignment, so make sure that you take note of it. All right, so two main subdivisions uh, or two main groups that our digestive system falls into. You probably know it as gastrointestinal tract, but it's also called the alimentary system. Um, the gastrointestinal tract is kind of what we call it nowadays more, but I'll re I will refer to as the alimentary system as well. Same with on your assignment will be referred to as the alimentary system. Reason being is because most likely you already know it's called the gastrointestinal tract. If you ever have gastroenteritis, well, that's inflammation of somewhere along the lines of your gastrointestinal uh, tract, okay? And then the second subgroup of your digestive system is the accessory organs. These are just like they're titled, accessory. They are assistive in nature to the digestive process, okay? So you can see in our gastrointestinal tract, we have uh, the mouth, the pharynx, the esophagus, the stomach, small intestines, large intestines, um, and then the colon, or the large intestines is the colon, but then the rectum and the anus, okay? Um, the accessory glands, tongue, uh, our teeth, the uh, salivary glands, uh, the pancreas, basically the pancreas is a big gland, okay? Um, that's a rudimentary way of thinking about it. Uh, the liver detoxifies the, detoxifies the blood, uh, allows for gluco, uh, glucose uh, production and uh, gluconeogenesis to occur, protein breakdown. A lot of different stuff occurs in the liver. We'll go into detail with that. Um, and then the gallbladder, you can see the gallbladder uh, right here. Sorry, that circle didn't really get it, but right there basically is the gallbladder. Okay. And then we have the gall ducts, so on and so forth. Um, this right here is an image just to show us uh, how the small intestines aligns with the pancreas, gallbladder, and liver, okay? Uh, this, the small intestines is not a part of the accessory organs. Okay, a lot going on. A, a lot of these slides are gonna have a lot going on, okay? Take the time, read some of the verbiage, uh, take notes on some of it, because um, it's gonna be pretty important for you moving forward. Uh, this should be review because we had this last week in lecture, all right? 
I know lab and lecture doesn't align up 100%, but we try and make it align somewhat. Um, so take home message from this, okay? GI tract versus accessory, basically what I just talked about, uh, but we can go into a little bit more detail here as far as, you know, breakdown into smaller fragments, uh, digest food, absorb fragments through into the lining into the blood. The majority of this occurs in the small intestines, although it does occur also in the stomach um, and then also in the colon. But the majority of our micronutrients and nutrients occur in the actual small intestines itself. Okay. You can kind of go on and, and read some of this. We'll talk about these salivary glands and then the pancreas and what they release in detail here, and I believe in the next slide. Okay, so the alimentary canal, also known as the gastrointestinal tract, okay, also known as the alimentary system. Um, this is uh, just another one of those slides that kind of shows the difference between the two, the related accessory digestive organs. One of the reasons why I like this slide so the most is it really does a good job of labeling a little bit of the physiology of each um, area. So uh, our old cavity teeth and tongue, liver, gallbladder, so on and so forth. I'm not going to read off every little bit of this, but go ahead and pause the video. This is where you write down, okay, esophagus, what does the esophagus do? Stomach, what does the stomach do? Pancreas, what does the pancreas do? Okay, this is a good brief analysis of each um, uh, item in the alimentary and the accessory uh, organs, okay, or, or system, I should say, all right? Uh, then this is part of your assignment as well. Okay, so once we take a bite of that food, let's say I'm hungry, I'm going to go grab an apple and I want to eat my apple. Digestion, okay? Uh, digestion begins immediately in the mouth, all right? especially if you're eating something that is carbohydrate rich, all right? Um, digestion occurs, begins in the mouth. Now, we also, we also call that ingestion. We're ingesting something, so we're eating something. We're putting it inside our body. That's ingestion. Um, but uh, digestion itself, the breakdown of the molecules or the breakdown of the compounds occurs um, immediately, all right? And they occur through a mixture of mechanical and a chemical response. Okay, that chemical response is that salivary amylase that's in the in the mouth that's released by the salivary glands. All right, and that starts to break down carbohydrates. Okay, we want to break it down into an easier substrate. Right. Nevertheless, we eat something, we ingest it, and then food needs to move. Well, we have Smooth muscle, okay, smooth muscle that lines all of our intestinal tract, okay, and that smooth muscle helps to move food through the body. This is a parasympathetic process, okay, meaning that it's unconscious or it's uh, not done consciously, okay. You don't eat uh, an apple or a piece of toast and you tell your body, hey, I want you to start moving that through my digestive tract. Now that doesn't happen, okay? So this propulsion that occurs, all right, this propulsion that occurs, occurs without us even thinking about it, all right? And there's two means of the propulsion that can occur, all right? The first one is peristalsis. Peristalsis is one of the main forms of food moving throughout our digestive tract. Uh, then there's uh, called segmentation. Okay, segmentation, <laughs> that just drew a line right through that. Segmentation is basically when food is moving forward then backward, okay? This is primarily so that food uh, breaks down mechanically, all right? Um, so we want the food to kind of move forward and backwards uh, throughout the GI tract and it kind of breaks it down mechanically. The stomach does a really good job of this and it helps to uh, churn the food within the stomach, breaking it down to a substance called chyme, C-H-I-M-E, chyme, okay? Uh, so continuing on, mechanical breakdown, segmentation, we talked about peristalsis. Peristalsis is where the smooth muscle contracts 
and basically the food flows through the GI tract, all right? Uh, digestion, series of enzymes that break down, it's a catabolic process, break down the food, okay? And then absorption, this is where the majority, like I said, the majority of this occurs in the, in the small intestines and nutrients get absorbed into uh, our body, okay? And then obviously the last one is we defecate. Yep, that's going to the bathroom. That's when we poop, okay? Uh, all right, neat little slide on uh, the breakdown on how food moves throughout the body. So take note of this, okay? We ingest, uh, food starts to move, um, it starts to propel through via peristalsis, okay? Uh, food enters our stomach. Our stomach uh, does a really good job of churning the food, okay? Breaks it down into chyme, then it moves into our small intestines. When it gets to our small intestines, then the small intestines begin segmentation and also peristalsis. All right, and then the food uh, moves. It doesn't look like normal food at this point. Now it's starting to look all brown and gushy and stuff like that. And that has to do also with uh, what is released by our gallbladder, okay, and our pancreas. And then absorption begins to occur in the small intestines. Um, and then lastly, when we get to the large intestines, then the, a lot of the absorption or uh, reabsorption that is going on is mainly H2O. This is where we can uh, kind of pull back hydration or release hydration and stuff like that. If we're overhydrated or underhydrated, aka dehydrated, right? Um, okay, so let's talk about the organization of the digestive system. So we have the two main systems, right? The GI tract. Um, and then we have the um, all of the accessory organs. Well, our abdominal cavity is a relatively closed system, okay? And there is a fascia that surrounds this entire system, multiple actually fascias, and layers of muscle. Remember our if you remember back from 216, we talked about how the abdominal and lumbar region are heavily fortified by muscles because we don't have a lot of bones there, all right? And this whole region here, okay, is heavily fortified by muscles and surrounded by multiple layers of tissue. These multiple layers of tissue are called the peritoneum, okay? Um, there's a visceral peritoneum and a parietal peritoneum, and you can see them here. Um, the mesentery, this is the mesentery ligament, but the mesentery is also part of that, and it surrounds our abdominal cavity. And basically, the whole job of the peritoneum and the mesentery is to hold, that fascia is to hold in our organs and keep it in a relatively closed system, okay? If we damage the mesentery, or we damage the peritoneum, and we get a tear, then depending on where it's at, either our small intestines can poke out, or our large intestines can poke out. If we have an inguinal hernia, or an umbilical hernia, if your umbilical herniates, okay? Um, so if you've heard of any of that stuff, uh, it's real popular among weightlifters, crossfitters, um, soccer players, uh, things like that, athletes mainly. Sometimes uh, extremely obese individuals can have problems with uh, hernias um, or pregnant women can have problems with hernias. Anything where the peritoneum or the mesentery gets stretched out and damaged, um, then you can have a hernia. And that's basically when there's a tear in that and then either your small intestines or your large intestines begins to poke outwards. Okay, and they do a surgery and they do this mesh to fix it. Uh, it's not the greatest surgery. Sometimes it's gotten better, but uh, it fails, tends to fail. Uh, so I got a couple slides here with uh, some good transverse um, views, uh, cross-sectional views, in other words, of the intestines um, or the, I should say, the abdominal cavity. Um, and then we can really see uh, the lining here. 
So you can see the muscle tissue, okay, muscle tissue here. So we have our rectus abdominis, all right? We have our external obliques, our internal obliques, okay? Here we have our quadratus lumborum. We have the sternal, or excuse me, not sternal, what am I The erector spinae, okay, or erector spinae, um, however you want to call it, all right? Um, tiny muscles back in here, the multifidus, the paraspinal muscles, things like that. Um, uh, so here we can see our kidneys, okay? Our kidneys are right here. Um, and uh, basically our intestines are in this region here. So this is the peritoneum. This is the uh, intraperitoneal cavity or the intraperitoneal um, organs, all right? And then if we look on this side here, we have the retroperitoneal cavity, all right, retroperitoneal cavity. And the retroperitoneal cavity contains the retroperitoneal organs, all right, uh, such as the large intestines, the colon, um, the pancreas, uh, not all of the pancreas, but majority of the pancreas, um, kidneys, so on and so forth, okay? Uh, okay, uh, so here's just another slide that does a good job of showing the uh, parietal peritoneum, visceral peritoneum, um, the peritoneal cavity, so on and so forth, okay? Uh, we are going to move on through, but you can read this slide and kind of take notes. Okay, I'm going to breeze through the next few really fast, uh, mostly because I, uh, you get tested on it in lecture, but not so much here in lab, okay? Um, so, uh, histology of the alimentary canal. So what are the layers of the alimentary canal or the alimentary system or the GI tract? Okay. So we have the mucosa layer, all right? Mucosa, just like it sounds, it's, uh, there's a good amount of mucus, right? It secretes mucus, digestive enzymes, hormones, um, uh, there's several layers of the mucosa, the epithelium, the lamina propria, and the muscularis mucosa. This is that smooth muscle that helps to cause peristalsis or even that segmentation to occur. Okay. Uh, epithelium. Remember, epithelium is basically epithelial tissue. So tissue that surrounds some type of uh, track or surface. The majority of the epithelium in the alimentary canal is simple columnar epithelium. If you remember back from that, so we have simple columnar. Um, if you remember back from 216, okay. And I'll let you read this slide. You know how I am. I don't like to just read off the slide. You can read the slide. I don't need to read it for you, okay. Uh, and then once again, this goes into detail of the other two layers. So you can read this as well. Go ahead and pause it if you need to, but you can read it as well. Take notes on this. Uh, more so lecture exam questions come from this then lab okay so this is a neat little clip art of the basic structure of the alimentary canal we can see the various layers of the mucosa the epithelium the lamina propria the muscularis mucosa all within this region here okay and then there's outer layerings outside of that the serosa Here's a good image of the mesentery itself, how it surrounds, it's the sheath that surrounds that inner portion. Um, and then you can see the nerves and stuff like that. Okay, submucosa, sub obviously beneath the mucosa layer. Okay, I'll let you read this, I'm not gonna read it. Um, and then the external smooth muscle once again, responsible for peristalsis and segmentation to occur. All right. Uh, so made up of the visceral peritoneum, the serosa. Okay. So this is this is made up of the uh, beginning to see the layers of uh, the abdominal cavity or the wall of the abdominal cavity that surround these organs. Okay. So this is kind of how it starts to differentiate from the actual organ itself to the layers that surround the organs. 
once again we can see that here okay and then just outer covering to that is the uh, mesentery uh, another good thing to talk about here is the lumen forgot to mention that uh, the lumen is basically the whole of whatever portion of the elementary canal we're talking about most likely when we're talking about the lumen we're talking about the uh, small intestines or the large intestines okay basically just the whole okay a lot of nerves a lot of nerves go into um this uh gi tract okay and i can't remember if i put it in this one or the other one or the next uh video but the gut okay the gut the gi tract elementary canal and the brain the gut and the brain play a uh, somewhat of a major role if you're really stressed out you will affect the enzymes you will affect the um, bacteria in your stomach you will affect the release of acids in your stomach you will affect your stomach okay which then will affect your brain back at it all right so the neural communication that goes on with the gut is really really important so bad stress not good on our gut health it actually decreases gut health okay um and so what can happen okay so effects of environmental stress on the brain can have lasting impact on gut health all right we can disrupt the function of these simple columnar cells not good bad news bears okay if that happens then we can have bad bacteria that can build up and not good it, it'll kill off good bacteria we don't want that okay sometimes if you take probiotics this can help all right this can help so if you're really stressed out uh then one of the good things to do is take probiotics so that you can uh, maintain your gut health and have a healthy gut health this will uh, help to avoid irritable bowel syndrome okay it'll help to avoid an upset stomach um you'll you know it, it'll just it'll it'll help with diarrhea help reduce diarrhea okay Go ahead and read this slide. It's a really interesting slide. Go ahead and read all this stuff. Um, but it's pretty interesting how the brain and the gut and the gut health uh, play a role with each other. Okay. So basic digestive enzymes. Okay, basic digestive enzymes. Now this is kind of hard to read. Um, but throughout our body, there's different enzymes, and there's more than just this, but there's enzymes that are released that um, help to stimulate or inhibit uh, things that go on. And this is part of that gut health as well, okay? So if I eat something, something comes in, okay, um, we have an enzyme that is released or chemical stimuli that occurs. Um, that helps to either control hunger, so granulin, um, somatostatin, okay, somatostatin uh, controls the release of gastrin, okay, gastrin is specific with the release of acids or pepsinogen or and pepsinogen, okay, acids and pepsinogen are basically the uh, products that cause the catabolic uh, effect on food and help to digest food, okay. Once we get food, there's also a stretch reflex that occurs. When we eat a lot of food, the stretch reflex helps to shut down hunger. Okay. Um, if food gets into here, well, let's say we eat a minimal amount of food, food gets into here. Well, there's an enzyme that helps to control satiety, okay, satisfaction, all right, or motility, the movements. This enzyme here helps to control that. But satiety basically is your feeling of hunger. So there's multiple areas throughout your GI tract that enzymes will help to regulate that. This one enzyme right here helps to regulate glucose levels. So this works in conjunction with your liver and then um, helps to uh, um, control satiety as well. Okay. 
so basically what, what I just talked about, so you know, some of these receptors, when stimulated, initiates reflex that stimulates smooth muscle, um, inhibit digestive glands that secrete digestive juices, so on and so forth, okay? So there's different reflexes. It's all about stimuli. It's all about feedback loops, positive and negative feedback loops. Food goes in, something occurs. There's a receptor that senses something, a lot of food, okay, we're going to tell the body, hey, we're not hungry anymore, or um, a certain type of food, or hey, let's bring this food in, or let's stimulate the release of acids, okay? Um, so a lot of receptors in there. Uh, okay, so this is basically just talking about what we were uh, just discussing. So intrinsic controls, extrinsic controls, what co what causes short-term reflexes, long-term reflexes, so on and so forth, autonomic okay, system control. All right, so speeding through the last little bit of this, talking about some of our accessory organs, okay, mouth, tongue, salivary glands, teeth, okay. Uh, so tongue, teeth, those are two main um, accessory organs. Our teeth help the mechanical process of breaking down food. Same with our tongue, that helps that to occur and begins the movement of food. Also is taste, that's somewhat important. And then we have glands. Okay, and our glands release that salivary amylase that helps begin the chemical breakdown. And you can go through this and read all that, right? So our soft palate back here, our hard, hard palate. Remember, this is our palatine process, and we have the palatine bone back here. Okay, our tonsil. All right, and I'll let you kind of read this. It's basic, basic anatomy here. Oh, taste buds, man. A lot of taste buds. Okay. Taste buds are good, right? That helps us enjoy food. We want our body, we want to be able to enjoy food. So our tongue is an interesting muscle, helps to move the food, but it's also loaded with taste buds. All right. Major function of saliva is this begins to break down carbohydrates. Salivary amylase is the, is the enzyme that does that, okay, that are secreted by the salivary glands. All right. Um, other, other things about saliva, helps to cleanse the mouth, dissolve food chemicals for taste, and then moistens food and then compacts it so that it can be then further broken down by the stomach. These are just the different glands that help to um, release saliva. Now, one of our main glands is right here, our uh, parotid gland. There's one underneath the mouth as well, but the main guy right here, if you ever eat anything sour, you'll feel this guy kind of contract and then shoot out some saliva. Kind of interesting. This is the composition of saliva. Once again, hands down, probably most important, right here, salivary amylase. There's another enzyme, though, linguinal lipase. Uh, this helps to break down uh, tissue so that we can absorb the taste better. Um, but you can then see all the properties of saliva and the pH. I'm just going to skip on this. You can pause this and read it. All right. Well, there you have it. Um, that was uh, the first part, part A. Um, so if you want to take a break right now, go ahead and take a break. Uh, we're going to get into part B here in just a moment. Um, but you should be able to complete a good amount of, uh, I can't remember which assignment sheet it was, but a good amount from either one. I think I kind of mixed up both on the lab assignment sheets, but that's part A. So let's move on to part B. Take a break if you need it. All right, let's go ahead and get started with this second half. Uh, we're going to go in a little bit more detail uh, with the digestive system. Um, and then uh, I'm going to talk about some gut health stuff and good bacteria versus bad bacteria and then uh, the remainder of the accessory organs that we didn't get to on the first time around. Okay, so 
what is the start of our elementary system? Well, we talked about it uh, earlier, but let's go a little bit deeper, right? We ingest food through the mouth, but it actually passes through our pharynx and then enters our esophagus. Now, our esophagus is a collapsible or flat-like structure that is lined with um, smooth muscle, okay? Uh, and if we talk about the lining of the pharynx itself, the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx, so this is where we can get laryngitis, right? If it's down into this area here, and we get inflammation down into this area here, this is where we can get our laryngitis. Uh, but the layers of the tissue here, First of all, the epithelial tissue is a stratified squamous, so we're not like our simple columnar. Our simple columnar really is what we what we want for diffusion and, and excretion and stuff to occur. Our stratified squamous epithelium, we want that to be um, relatively protective, okay? Some mucus producing glands within that tissue, but definitely not as much as we see in the simple columnar uh, epithelial tissue. All right, uh, the external uh, muscles uh, consist of uh, skeletal muscles, but there's also smooth muscles as well, and that's that inner layer um, that runs longitudinally, okay? When we get to our uh, esophagus, which is down here, okay, we want this to be flat and somewhat pliable so that food could kind of move down, but also so that it doesn't obstruct our airway, right? We don't want it pushing into our trachea. Our trachea is relatively strong because of the cartilaginous tissue that it's made out of. Okay, so like I said, the esophagus, relatively flat. Um, it has sphincters, okay? Uh, specifically a sphincter just before the stomach, all right? But there are sphincters on um, both sides uh, that help to prevent acid reflux, okay? We don't want acid reflux, that would be bad. Okay, that's when acid splashes up into the esophagus and starts to actually eat away at the esophageal lining or the epithelial tissue of the esophagus. Okay, um, in our stomach, acid can reside because of the production of mucus, and that mucus helps to protect our stomach. That's why if you take a lot of anti inflammatories like ibuprofen, um, that decreases the production of mucus and then thereby. Uh, decreasing your mucosal lining in your stomach and that can actually cause an ulcer or a lesion inside your stomach um, that we call like a peptic ulcer okay all right the stomach just like it says right there temporary storage tank but it does a little bit more than just store okay we get chemical breakdown and mechanical breakdown all right um, that mechanical breakdown helps to convert the food into chyme, okay? I think I spelled chyme wrong the last time in the last video. It's a Y, not an I. I don't know why I said that. Um, but nevertheless, uh, so food breaks down into chyme, becomes like a paste-like material, all right? What helps to break down the food into chyme is the many folds in it, all right? As you can see here, these rugae, all right? Number one, these are lined with mucus. And number two, it helps to churn the food. That's that rumbling and grumbling you hear um, or you can feel as well you know, when you've eaten a lot of food, all right? And then you can even hear the food being squirted into the small intestines, especially when it gets towards the uh, finish or the end of um, you passing your food from your stomach into the small intestines the first layer or the first region of the small intestines is the I call it the duodenum some people call it the duodenum um, I don't really care what you call it I call it the duodenum uh, but other people call it the duodenum um, there's probably other names for it too I don't know you know how anatomy is nevertheless so there's portions and regions of the stomach. I'm not gonna test you on those. This is an introductory anatomy course. Okay, if you wanna become a GI doc, then you're gonna know every aspect of this. 
um, but for the purpose of this course here, um, just know that food is churned and it's slowly churned and pushed through. And then when it gets here, we reach the pyloric sphincter. Okay. And then this is kind of where food is kind of squirted on through into the small intestines. All right. So it passes the pyloric sphincter. Okay, um, by the way, it was called the pyloric sphincter because that region of the stomach is called the pylorus, all right? That's that in uh, the distal aspect of the stomach. So what does the lining of the stomach, the microscopic lining of the stomach look like? Well, it's this right here, okay? So we have a longitudinal layer of muscle. We have muscle again. So this helps to cause that kind, move the stomach back and forth. Another muscle layer here another muscle layer here so our stomach has got a lot of muscle in it okay this is really important through here and then there's also bacteria that reside throughout our stomach as well um, but this area here is really important specifically these cells okay these cells are what help to create number one uh, the mucus and number two uh, the acids, okay, mucus is also created here and then excreted on through. So what are the glands that are found in that one layer that I said is really important? Well, first, the mucosal neck cells, the parietal cells, chief cells, and the entroendocrine cells, okay, specifically uh, sort of hormonal cells here, okay. Uh, so hydrochloric acid, hydrochloric acid, that is what is produced um, by our parietal cells, okay? So the parietal cells is what produces the acid that helps to break down and digest food, all right? Um, so as we see again, the parietal cells secretion include hydrochloric acid. Um, then there's other intrinsic factors, so some proteins and stuff like that, um, that help for absorption to occur. So some absorption does occur in the stomach, specifically vitamin B. Also, alcohol gets absorbed in the stomach and certain types of sugars, okay, that gets absorbed in the stomach. That's why if you take a shot on an empty stomach or drink a beer on an empty stomach or a glass of wine, you feel it relatively fast because the absorption occurs in the stomach itself. Also in the small intestines, but it begins heavily in the stomach. Now, if you eat something, that slows the absorption, okay? And your food soaks up, soaks in it. Our chief cells secretes pepsin or pepsinogen, okay? Um, it's an in pepsinogen is an enzyme inactive that becomes active with pepsin because of hydrochloric acid. Okay, and it helps uh, to provide a positive feedback mechanism so that it slows the secretion of hydrochloric acid um, and helps along with uh, digestion. Specifically, lipase uh, helps with digestion. Okay. And then uh, you can see some of the hormones that are released. Uh, remember somatostatin, we talked about that in the last lab, and then gastrin. These hormones uh, are basically uh, the neurofeedback loop that occurs, uh, basically telling the brain uh, what's going on in the stomach. Okay. So bacteria. Bacteria exist uh, within our uh, small intestines, large intestines, and there's some good bacteria. There's some bad bacteria. Okay. Now this bacteria right here is good. However, in small numbers, if this bacteria increases to uh, a, a, a lot or too much, then it becomes bad, okay? This right here is one of the better ba bacteria that we have. And then same with this one, lacto, uh, lacto ba uh, baculi, and then bifidobacteria. Now there's a lot of bacteria, by the way, 
in our gut. And if you take probiotics, you'll get million parts, billion parts, so on and so forth. Um, these are just some of the main ones, okay? Um, but read these. These are really important. Write them down. It's going to be part of your assignment. We got this nice happy guy right here. Why? Because he is filled with roughage, fiber. This helps with intestinal movement. Um, it helps with gut health. Veggies and fruits are very, very, very good for your gut health, okay? If you're really stressed out, you take some probiotics and then eat some veggies and fruits, that'll help you. It'll actually help decrease your stress. This I just thought was a neat slide. This is what the inside of your small intestines look like. Um, so this is no or little to no bacteria. So let's just say it's just good bacteria resides in here. This is an overproduction of bacteria. Okay, so too much, whether good or bad. We don't want this much, okay? And if it's bad bacteria, bad news bears. We don't want that. Then we get GI upset. We can get a bacterial infection, uh, infection gastroenteritis, diarrhea, irritable bowel syndrome, all that lovely stuff that nobody likes. All right, our accessory organs, liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. We already discussed about the ones towards the top. Okay. What are some of the uh, broad main functions? Liver uh, helps to digest food. It releases bile. Our gallbladder really does that. Okay. Um, but our liver helps to release it. Our liver also is involved with glucose um, moderation or glucose release. It's involved with excess protein degradation uh, or breakdown or uh, metabolic rate or, or metabolic process for protein substrates. Um, so if we have too much protein in our body or we have too much muscle breakdown, our liver has to detoxify. Our liver also detoxifies our blood. Um, so if we drink too much alcohol, our liver is doing the work. Uh, so our liver does a lot, okay? Really important organ. Our gallbladder, storage of bile, and it's released by the liver. And then our, remember, bile helps to break down fats. Um, and then pancreas releases almost the exact same enzyme that is released by the salivary gland. It's called pancreatic amylase and it helps to do the remainder of carbohydrate breakdown all right it also releases biocarbonate to neutralize the stomach acid because we don't want food passing from our stomach to our small intestines that's loaded with acid hydrochloric acid that then will start to break down and cause lesions in our small intestines so what our pancreas actually does is releases bicarbonate so that it can neutralize the stomach acid um, so that we don't have breakdown of our small intestines. All right, here's a picture of our liver. Okay, remember our liver is in the right upper quadrant or the, hypochond the right hypochondriac region. It also crosses over into our epigastric region. Okay, just a neat picture. Posterior aspect, now we can see the gallbladder. Okay, the bile ducts, the hepatic vein, it's cut, but the hepatic vein goes through here. Okay, the different lobes. I'm not going to go into detail with the anatomy here. Um, okay, an important slide, part of your assignment. Okay, we have our inferior vena cava. This is responsible. This goes straight to the heart, if you remember from 216. This is responsible for bringing blood from... The function of this is blood from the visceral cavity up to the heart. So it helps to remove waste products. Okay. Gallbladder, production of bile released by the liver. Okay. So really important. Gallbladder helps to break down uh, fatty acids. Well, bile, really. So what are some problems if we have homeostatic imbalance of liver? Well, we can get hepatitis. Uh, this is inflammation of the liberal, viral infection, drug toxicity, uh, wild mushroom poisoning can cause hepatitis. Okay, cirrhosis. This is when we have chronic inflammation or chronic hepatitis, and then cirrhosis is just breakdown of the liver, the liver itself. Okay, not good. If you get cirrhosis, 
liver cirrhosis. Your liver does not function well. You don't detoxify. You don't help to metabolize uh, proteins. You don't uh, you, you don't have control over your glucose substrates or um, uh, glycogen stores. Uh, you have problems with a process called gluconeogenesis, which is the uh, transfer of protein substrates into a glucose-like molecule. If our glucose is too low or we don't have enough carbohydrates, we need, to do, we need to undergo a process called gluconeogenesis so that glycolysis can occur again. All right. Um, so yeah, that's liver. Gallbladder. Uh, basically, like what we said earlier, um, helps to release bile. Okay. Cystic duct is uh, where our, where the bile is released from. Okay, flows into the bile duct. Not so important. Some of this stuff. Pancreas. Um, I'm not going to test you too much on this uh, for this time around in the lab. Uh, main important thing of pancreas that you need to know is first of all, pancreatic amylase. Okay, released pancreatic amylase and also the second other important thing of the pancreas is the release of um, insulin via what's called the isolates of Langerhans. Those are tiny um, or, or, or large like cluster of cells that sit on top of the pancreas. Okay. They sit on top of the pancreas and then they, they their job is to release insulin when there's too much uh, glucose and then that is then released into the bloodstream okay once again pancreatic amylase is released all right but two most important thing is pancreatic amylase and insulin via the uh, isolates of Langerhans okay or the pancreatic isolates all right, the small intestines. We have roughly two to four meters of small intestines. By the way, if I'm going too fast, you can pause the video and go backwards. That's the beauty of having a video. So we break up the divisions of the small intestines into three sections. The duodenum or duodenum, jejunum or ileum. Okay, well not or, and. So duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Here we can see the three portions. We have the duodenum or duodenum, kind of comes down behind the colon, comes through all the way around. This is still our duodenum. And then we get to our jejunum. And then it's our jejunum all the way through, all the way through, and then until we get to the ileum. Okay. And then here is where the ileum then passes on and connects into the uh, colon or the large intestines and then we have our appendix right here and then our colon our large intestines we have our ascending colon transverse colon descending colon and then down and really the main main job of the colon is regulation of h2o okay just a close-up look of our pancreas so on and so forth okay uh all right i'm not going to go deep into this you can read this okay nerve supply a lot of nerves go down into the uh, organ tissue because a lot of function occurs and remember it is parasympathetic innervation via the vagus nerve okay any sympathetic innervation is the thoracosplenic nerve okay sympathetic is what shuts down um activation so that we can move and do stuff if we need to of our shuts down our digestive process or, or inhibits it better said okay you can you can read this some of the microscopic anatomy of the small intestines we saw a picture of this earlier that i showed you you saw the villi those finger-like projections um that line the inner part that's probably one of the most important aspects of our small intestines okay but you can read what each of these does or is is responsible for Okay, here's a little uh, good image of the villi itself. And then our lumen, and then our muscle layers. Right? We have the longitudinal layer and then the transverse layer. 
um, and this is smooth muscle. This helps for peristalsis to occur. Okay, so we get that uh, contraction so that peristalsis occur. And also segmentation occurs. That's why we have the two layers. So one's responsible for segmentation, the other's responsible for peristalsis. Um, oh, I don't know why I left this uh, left this in here. That's my bad, my B. Uh, but go through. So I'm not going to read everything on here. I want you to write down major functions of all of this, okay? So you can pause or go back or rewind. Look at the major functions of, of um, each section. Look at the comments, okay? This, some of this stuff will be on your exam. Same thing, small intestines, major functions, comments. Once again, sorry, I left that uh, column in there. Had some stuff that was not important, so. Okay, I'll let you read that through, okay? So pause that, write down each major function and then some of the additional functions as well. Okay, large intestines. All right, I'm not too worried about the uh, regions. Just know it as ascending, transverse, and descending. Uh, I'm not too worried about what the type of muscles are called, all right, or the pocket-like sacs or anything like that. Um, you don't need to know those in my class, but I, I wanted to at least show them to you. What's important here at the beginning of the ascending colon, right where the ilium meets the appendix, which is right here, or excuse me, the, um, which is uh, right here. So the ilium meets, let me use a different color here, meets the large intestines right here, the colon. Well, right here is the appendix. The appendix is really small. At a certain point in our life, we thought, or the theory is, is that this was much larger and it was used almost as a second stomach. Right now, it's mostly lymphoidal tissue, so it's used as a bacterial storehouse. Hopefully, good bacterial, okay? Um, it's twisted in shape, and if it gets blocked and it gets infected, this is where you can get an appendicitis, all right? Once again, we went over this ascending colon, transverse, and descending. You can look at the different areas of the colon and what it does. Okay, most important thing though is um, the function is H2O. Okay, uh, water, hydration. And this is obviously a cadaver. Or we can see how the mesentery kind of ties into this fascia. The, remember, the mesentery is the fascia that kind of surrounds a lot of it and helps keep it all connected. And then, uh, then is attached to the peritoneum, that outer laying, outer layer, I should say. Once again, you see the mesentery. Obviously, uh, this is the organs are taken away. Okay, like the small intestines and the liver and all that sort of jazz and fun stuff. Um, but you can see how the mesentery kind of connects all of it around. If the mesentery tears, that's no good. That can then lead to a hernia. And then this, once again, is just a cool picture of a sagittal view. Um, and we can kind of see uh, how the mesentery kind of connects out and goes through. But remember, that outer covering through here, our peritoneum, and then our outer peritoneum, the parietal peritoneum. Okay, we have a visceral peritoneum that encapsulates each little area. All right, so that a lot of that stuff we talked about in the last video. All righty, thanks guys. I uh, hope you learned a little bit this lab. Um, Go ahead and complete those lab assignment sheets, and then uh, you should have a quiz here that you can find on the module. Um, I kind of I had, I haven't decided yet if I'm going to do an all-encompassing quiz, this plus urinary system, um, or a quiz just for this. If I do a quiz just for this, it'll probably be relatively short, um, but you should be able to find it here soon. If I haven't posted it yet, you'll have it by the end of the week. Okay. Thanks.